If musicians bored me with talk of gear and guitars, I soon found out that most of the actors I met wanted to talk about only themselves. They seemed to endure listening to their peers only so they would get a turn to talk about themselves. Still, I welcomed the change of scenery for a while. I started going to the theater almost every week. I had a ticket broker, and I'd call and say, what have you got for tonight? I found it interesting that so many people in New York, myself included, talked about the culture of the city, but never actually experienced it. Here was an opportunity to do it. I went to see whatever was playing, from the big production British musicals like Miss Saigon, Cats, and Les Miserables, to more serious plays like American Buffalo, Waiting for Godot, and Death of a Salesman. I took some acting classes, too. I sat in on Lee Strasberg's classes once or twice. At one class, a woman got up to do a scene in front of him and broke down crying before she started the scene. This is nuts. I thought you acted from joy, not torment. Strasberg's wife, Anna, took a liking to me, and I went to a few parties at their house. I came away with the impression that none of these people wanted to be happy because they feared it might compromise their acting ability. They had to be brooding and miserable, and hence everyone in the room seemed to be under his or her own personal dark cloud. I felt as if I should have taken an umbrella. This is not for me. One night when I was out at a restaurant having dinner, the actress Donna Dixon and a model friend of hers walked in. Donna was staggeringly attractive, so much so that it was intimidating. So much so that I went for the woman who turned out to be her roommate. Donna was just too beautiful. But after I had seen her friend a few times, I admitted to myself and to her that I was actually interested in Donna. And somehow it worked. I started seeing Donna. I loved having such a gorgeous girlfriend. As superficial as it may have been, she was beautiful in a way that made me happy. With hindsight, I can see that dating her was clearly another example of my trying to eradicate my own imperfections by being with someone seemingly perfect. Anyone who could date a woman who looked like that must be special. But at the time, I was very taken with her. When she entered a room, the room came to a halt, and I was with her. Donna had landed her first big role starring opposite Tom Hanks in the TV show Bosom Buddies. She shuttled back and forth to L.A. for that, and we continued to see each other. During this time, Ace announced he wanted to quit the band. I drove up to his house in Westchester and spent the day with him. We went to the mall, drove around, talked. Don't leave, I told him. Stay in the band. I need to go, he said. I found out years later that he didn't remember I had been there. Many pages of Ace's past are now blank. That's how blasted he was. He was living in a constant state of blackout. Bill worked out a deal to let Ace leave, but have him make promotional appearances for the next album, which we planned to make in Los Angeles. In some ways, I was glad Ace finally left. We couldn't go anywhere with him the way he was. Everybody around the band seemed to be suffering from the same disease. It's one thing to be useless. It's another to be a detriment. Bill had gone from sharing office space with Howard Marks Advertising to first having one floor and then two floors of a building on Madison Avenue, plus a Los Angeles office. He had people developing film projects and dozens more people on the payroll. I had no idea what they all did. He had a huge luxury apartment near St. Patrick's Cathedral that he'd spent a fortune decorating, but that he rented rather than owned. He was now making such bad decisions that I often followed up on meetings he had on our behalf. What did he agree to, I'd ask. Then I'd have to nullify things. It was clearly the drugs. Eventually, his drug habit became so all-encompassing that he could no longer go to the office. He was home freebasing, holed up with a pipe. When things change incrementally, sometimes you don't realize how far you've gotten from where you started. That's basically what happened with Bill. When I looked at him, he still appeared to be the person I knew. When he was lucid, he still sounded like the person I knew. But he wasn't that person anymore, even if it took me a long time to recognize that fact. Bill had gone from being our visionary mentor, our manager, a father figure, a fifth member of the band, to being a delusional, drugged-out whack job. It was so bad that heart-to-heart -heart talks I had with him went nowhere except to confirm the worst. What are you doing, I'd ask him. You're spending all your money. I don't care, he'd reply. I made it once, and I can make it again. 
It was a reckless attitude, and it mirrored Ace and Peter. They all took things for granted. Watching all these guys go down the tubes with drugs or booze, seeing their demise, I realize that it's all a question of what people do with the freedom that success affords. There were times when Gene wanted to have company in his stance of, we don't drink or take drugs, but that wasn't my stance. I had nothing against drinking, and I had smoked pot when I was younger, but when I saw what the Casablanca office turned into, what Bill turned into, or what Ace and Peter turned into, I didn't think that transformation was just the luck of the draw. They made their own destinies. Finally, after Gene, Eric Carr, and I convened in L.A. to start work on the next album, Creatures of the Night, Gene and I discussed parting ways with Bill. It was sad and scary to contemplate letting go of someone who had been so instrumental in our careers. It would be a monumental change, not something to take lightly. We had worked with him for almost a decade. Despite what was going wrong, all the good stuff during the formative years wouldn't have happened without Bill. He was instrumental in our development, and he was the glue that kept everybody together. He knew how to press the buttons in each member to keep all of us happy. Each of us felt like his favorite. But we realized we had reached a point where rebuilding KISS was going to mean getting rid of everything we had known. We were already rid of two members, and we had experienced such waste and coddling that it had taken away our autonomy and independence, which is in essence what it's designed to do. Bill's system had catered to our needs, but cut us off from reality. It was life in a bubble, and it was killing us. I even suggested we take our makeup off to make a complete break with the past. In the end, Gene didn't want to take off the makeup, but we did decide that Bill had to go. We called him from L.A. Bill, we're going to fly to New York to meet you. I always believed you owed it to yourself and the other person to look that person in the eye at the end of a relationship, whether it was a business relationship or a romantic relationship. When we arrived at his office, Bill said, I know why you're here. It's time, we said. He smiled wistfully. We shook hands, hugged, and walked out on a big chapter of our lives. Chapter 39 As we prepared to make our next album, Creatures of the Night, not a lot of A-list producers were knocking at our door. In fact, people weren't even returning our phone calls. Finally, in the summer of 1982, I scheduled a lunch in L.A. where we planned to record the album with a guy named Michael James Jackson. We met at a restaurant called The Melting Pot on the corner of La Cienica Boulevard and Melrose. Michael, it turned out, had no real experience with rock and roll bands, though he had just worked with Jesse Colin Young, the founder of the band The Young Bloods, who had had some hits in the 1960s. When we started chatting, Michael said, What you guys need to do is write some hit songs. Gee, why didn't I think of that? Fucking brilliant! But I liked him, despite being momentarily thrown by that insight. He was very introspective and intellectual, and we began to hit it off. Also, even though I wasn't sure what he had to offer musically, we needed someone. I knew that Gene and I weren't at a point where we could be productive together because neither of us wanted to compromise our respective musical ideas. We needed an intermediary in the studio, someone to be the swing vote. Gene and I never wrote songs together anymore. Michael brought up the idea of bringing in outside songwriters to work on the record with us. I suggested Brian Adams, who had written a minor hit called Let Me Take You Dancing, together with Jim Valance. Even though his voice was sped up and sounded like a girl's on that track, I thought there was something there. When we flew him to L.A., though, Brian ended up writing with Gene, and they came up with War Machine. With Ace Gone, we put the word out that we were looking for a new guitar slinger. Among others, we auditioned Steve Farris of Mr. Mister, Robin Ford, who was a great blues player, and Steve Hunter. Richie Sambora, who was in a newly formed band called Bon Jovi, flew in from New Jersey to audition. He wasn't yet the consummate player he would become, and he didn't get the gig. It's funny, but years later I heard him saying he hadn't really wanted the job because he wanted to be in something more blues-based. First of all, it's hard to imagine that he flew to California to audition for Kiss just because he liked airplane food. Also, Bon Jovi's done a lot of great things, but they don't sit next to Howlin' Wolf in my record collection. Another person I spoke to was a really sweet young kid named Saul Hudson. 
He told me his mom had been a seamstress for David Bowie and that his friends called him Slash. He was very well-spoken and engaging, but he seemed really young. Finally, I asked him how old he was. I'll be 17 next month, he said. I had turned 30 earlier that year, and Gene was twice this kid's age. You know, I said, you sound like a great guy, but I think you're too young for this. I wished him well and always remembered him because he was so nice and unaffected. In the end, a lot of different people played solos on Creatures of the Night. It was a way to try people out and to see who might fit the feel of a given track. Eddie Van Halen came to the studio one day, knowing we were looking for a guitar player. He listened to some of the stuff we had, including a solo on the title track by Steve Farris. Wow, why don't you get that guy, asked Eddie. He was blown away. The fact was, we had rehearsed with Farris, but the fit hadn't been right. Eddie was really unhappy at the time and called me at home a few times. He was pretty out of it, and he wanted to talk about the Kiss solo albums. Why did you do it, he asked. Why did you go off and do solo albums? It was clear that this had something to do with his own band, which was in turmoil at the time, but he didn't say exactly what was happening. He seemed to be looking to me for answers, but I was never sure what the question was. I wrote the songs Creatures of the Night and Danger with a guy named Adam Mitchell who had been in a Canadian band called The Paupers. Adam had also written with a guitar player named Vincent Cusano, and even though Adam didn't have a lot of nice things to say about Vinny as a person, he said he was a very talented singer-songwriter and that his guitar playing might fit Kiss. It was a scene that would play out often. People always talked about Vinny's talent and ability, but they never had good things to say about him as a person. Hmm. The first time Vinny came to the studio, he started doing a solo and got down on his knees. I thought it was one of the goofiest things I'd ever seen. You just didn't do that at an audition. He seemed wrong somehow. He was odd-looking and shifty. But we were between a rock and a hard place, and Vinny ended up playing on a lot of tracks for the album. For us, Creatures was done with the shock and realization of how completely lost we had gotten. The album was a declaration of our intent to get back on track. Eric was relieved as this was what he had expected all along. He was definitely happier all through the recording process. One afternoon, a carload of little kids and what I presumed was one of their dads showed up at the studio and Gene ushered them into the room where we recorded. They gathered around a microphone. They were there to sing background vocals on a song. What the hell? Gene, it turned out, had made a deal with a Hollywood producer. If the guy could send his kids and their friends to sing background vocals on a Kiss song, Gene would get some brownie points for some acting work out of the guy. Are you fucking kidding me? I was furious, and not just because Gene hadn't asked in advance for my okay. He was whoring us out and compromising our album for his own benefit. It offended me that he tried to get acting roles in that way. I had been studying acting long before he had the idea to get into movies. In fact, he had told me he had no interest in acting. To me, the path was obvious. You studied acting and then auditioned for parts. That was the right way to go about it. Gene didn't see it that way. He just went out and brown-nosed his way in. If you walk behind an elephant, you end up cleaning up the shit. I spent my free time in L.A. with Donna Dixon. Part of the reason I invested so much in Donna was because she still managed to keep me at arm's length, no matter the closeness we had developed. That ignited my old compulsion to see the relationship as a challenge to overcome. Even though we were together, there was still something lacking, and I kept trying to get whatever that was. I was awed by her beauty and placed her on a pedestal, which quickly must become one of the most boring and unsexy places for a woman to be. My dad, though, would no doubt have approved. Once we finished recording Creatures, I spent much of the rest of the year going back and forth between L.A. and New York to see Donna. She came to New York a lot, too, and lived out of my apartment. After her TV show Bosom Buddies got canceled, she auditioned for a movie called Dr. Detroit. She told me after the audition that she thought that Dan Aykroyd, the star of the film, was a genius. I thought that assessment was a stretch. Donna was looking for a new financial advisor, so I introduced her to Howard Marks. Howard had a pot belly and always wore his pants below his stomach, using suspenders to hold up his trousers. Not uncharacteristically, the day we went to see him, he'd probably had a few stiff drinks beforehand. He was eating his lunch at his desk when we arrived. 
He gave Don a big talk about saving for the future and how important financial planning was. And after this long dissertation, he stood up and started to walk over to a side table in the corner of his office with the remains of his lunch and his dirty napkins on a lunch tray. As he got up, it was as if it was happening in slow motion. I could see his suspenders dangling down. He must have taken them off his shoulders while sitting at his desk. As he started to cross the room, his pants began to shimmy downward until they dropped to the floor. Howard looked down, threw his tray in the air, reached for his pants and screeched, Oh my God! Is this normal? Donna asked me. She landed the role in Dr. Detroit, and I visited her on the set in Chicago and gave her a diamond ring. I didn't call it an engagement ring. The relationship was stagnating somewhat. Something was lacking for both of us, but I didn't want to lose her, and I didn't want to be left. Sometimes Donna would drop out of sight, and I wouldn't hear from her for a few days. She was living out of my place when she was in New York, and just before Christmas, I found a new fur coat in the closet. She said she'd taken it from the wardrobe department of something she was working on. It wasn't too long before she blindsided me by suddenly talking about having never been on her own and needing space. I told her that I didn't want to be just another guy dating her and didn't want to share her. Although there were more unanswered questions now and more distance between us, we dropped the subject and didn't bring it up again for a while. Then I saw among her things a little t-shirt with Martha's Vineyard on the front of it. Martha's Vineyard? When had she gone to Martha's Vineyard? She would explain her disappearances away, kind of. I didn't ask too many questions either because I wasn't sure I wanted to know the truth. And anyway, when someone was inconsiderate or dishonest, it reinforced what I thought of myself. This is what I deserve. If only I can get her to like me. Chapter 40 Kiss shot a video for I Love It Loud with Ace. Then he went with us to Europe for some lip-synced promotional appearances at the time of the release of Creatures of the Night. He was very fragile, and in Europe he said to me, I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I can't do this anymore. When we flew back to the States, that was it. Ace was gone for good. Ace, Peter, Bill O'Coin, all gone. People were dropping like flies all around us. Neil Bogart had died of cancer while we were making Creatures. Even though he wasn't involved with the record company anymore, his death severed another tie to our past. Richard Monnier, a recent tour manager and one of my closest friends, was the first person I knew to die of AIDS that same year. And Wally Myrowitz, one of our booking agents in New York, another buddy and confidant, died from a combination of booze and barbiturates. Where did everybody go? Gene seemed fixated on Hollywood and spent as little time as possible on things related to the band. In his inimitable, dismissive, self-serving style, Gene liked to say, well, Paul only wants to be a rock star. I want so much more in life. I didn't understand why everybody was jumping ship. We were still Kiss, and I still looked at the band as my life raft. Where did everybody go? We had a tour schedule to start on December 27, 1982, and we didn't have a permanent replacement for Ace yet. I'd felt from the get-go that Vinny wouldn't work in the band. And in the interim, some nasty rumors had spread about him stealing equipment from the rehearsal studio, but nobody else was on the horizon. When the decision was made to bring him in, I said to Gene, I just want to go on record saying this is a bad move. With the Creatures Tour coming on the heels of several financial disasters, we'd had to tighten our belt so Vinny didn't get a Porsche. Vinny wanted to change his name to Mick Fury when he got the gig. Why did everybody come up with cartoon names? I just looked at him like, are you serious? We settled on Vinnie Vincent. After playing around with ideas for his makeup, I designed the Egyptian Ankh image. As far as his knowledge of and understanding of the guitar, Vinny was terrific. I'd written with him and heard him play and sing and knew his talent. The problem was that he had no sense of what to play or when, and he had no ability to self-edit. His playing was like puking. It just came splattering out. He wanted to show how fast he could play, how many notes he could play. He didn't think things out. This became more problematic when the tour started. On stage, Vinny was hell-bent on using every solo as an opportunity to showcase himself. But it doesn't work like that. It's all about context. Vinny never seemed to grasp that. 
He was intensely jealous of guys like Randy Rhodes and Jakey e. Lee because he thought he was as good as them. He wanted his just do, and his solo spot in the middle of the show became ungodly long. We used to call it the high point of the show because everybody in the audience left to go get high. Not that many people saw his wannabe guitar heroics. The Creatures Tour did horrendously in most markets. Before we went on stage, we'd hear, You wanted the best, you got the best, the hottest band in the land. And we'd walk out to find nobody was there. Sometimes there would be only a thousand people in an arena that could hold 18,000. We had packed the same venues a few years before, but now, if I threw my guitar pick too far, it sailed over people's heads and landed on the floor. We'd pull into arenas that looked as if somebody had forgotten to turn off the parking lot lights after an event was long over. And then we'd get inside and hear the echo from the main hall and know for sure it was empty. We left blood, as they say in the business. It was a death march for us and for the concert promoters. At first, the instinct was to blame other people. Oh, it's the promoter's fault. But if people want to see you, it doesn't take an incentive to get them to a show. And if they don't want to see you, the promoter can't make them buy a ticket at knife point. We had to face the fact that people didn't come because they didn't want to. Obviously, we had to pay penance for our unmasked and the elder. We got back on track with creatures, but fans were not that forgiving. It was going to take years to win back our fans and make new fans. We had betrayed them. We had betrayed ourselves, too, and we weren't going to be easily forgiven. It's shocking in hindsight what we had done, and we spent years making up for it. The people who turned off to us weren't going to come back just because we said we were sorry. We had to prove it, and that took a lot of time. Creatures alone was not enough. But nothing can prepare you for the shock of vast, empty spaces. It was unfathomable that from one tour to the next, the audience just disappeared. The bottom had fallen out. I loved the position I had. I loved the stature of the band and how I was perceived. And losing that was horrible. Horrible. I dealt with the depression by sleeping. It was my way of checking out. I was so depressed that I couldn't keep my eyes open anywhere. It got so bad that I fell asleep in the dressing room before shows. Sometimes I dozed off before I did my makeup. Sometimes I dozed off in my makeup. The crew had a hard time waking me up. I still looked to Donna for a sense of calm and security. I could spend hours talking to her on the phone every day. She was gearing up for the release of Dr. Detroit. She told me once again that she needed space. I told her I still wasn't prepared to be one of several people she was dating and that if she really wanted to break up, she had to face me in person. I bought her an airline ticket to our next tour stop. She flew in, and it was over. My depression deepened. I don't know whether the tour situation or the overall band crisis affected Gene. He wasn't fully vested in the band at that point. After all, he had brought in a carload of kitties to sing on the album and was clearly looking elsewhere. He's never been one to verbalize his feelings, so it wasn't something we talked about, even though we were both certainly aware of what was happening. Eric, for his part, didn't understand the financial side. He wasn't aware of how the disastrous turnouts related to our budgeting. He just loved being in the band and loved playing the material from the new album. A few months after my all-or-nothing ultimatum to Donna, I decided it was just too hard. Nothing and no one had filled the void. Anything I got from her was better than nothing. I took a deep breath and called her. She seemed stunned. I told her how I felt, and we started speaking frequently on the phone again. Talk of missing each other wasn't uncommon. We even got together when Kiss played a show in L.A. One morning, just before we left for South America for the last leg of the tour, I glanced at a copy of the newspaper and a small article caught my eye. The actress Donna Dixon has married her Dr. Detroit co-star Dan Aykroyd, newly discovered paperwork shows. The marriage license came to light in Martha's Vineyard. What? Martha's Vineyard? It turned out they had already been married for three months. I was stunned to realize that during the time that we had been talking again, she had been on the verge of getting married and then, in fact, had gotten married. Suddenly, I felt like I was underwater. I could barely move. I called her. You were married when we were talking? She said something about how she hoped I would find what she had found. No explanation, no apology. I hung up. From then on, it was a struggle to do anything. 
Depression held me like a vice. I had to push myself every day, get your ass out of bed. Everything around me was caving in. Just keep moving, otherwise you drown. The press seemed to take delight in seeing Kiss implode. After I struggled out of bed one day to get to an interview, the reporter asked me, how does it feel to be on the Titanic? Writers looked at us as a commodity and forgot that we were people. Another interviewer asked, how does it feel to be dying? They were so hateful. Their coldness and perverse joy was not lost on me. Still, I realized something when fielding mean-spirited questions like that day after day. Nobody is going to tell me when this is over. Sure, everything around me had gone wrong, but what about me? What about my survival? That was up to me. How does it feel to be dying? Those pricks on the phone were not going to decide whether I got the thumbs up or thumbs down in the arena. Kiss was everything to me. And right then I swore I would do whatever it took to keep my life raft afloat. Kiss will never die. Part 4. Under the Gun. Chapter 41. In June 1983, we flew to Brazil and played to 180,000 screaming fans in Maracanã Stadium in Rio. It was the biggest audience we had ever performed in front of. Taking the stage in the soccer stadiums of South America, I realized the stadiums we think of as big in the States were minuscule by comparison. Tiny. When you walk into a stadium like Maracanã, you feel like you're in the bottom of an oil drum. Another difference is the security. During the afternoon when we were checking things out, armed militia milled around with dogs. There's no way to describe the amount of energy that a crowd that big puts out. And all the energy was directed at us up on the stage. You might say the air was electric or that there was a sense of anticipation, hysteria, call it what you will. But when it's all directed at you, it's like a huge wave that can consume you. The amount of power pushing at you is incredible. It can almost take you off your feet. And yet, as exhilarating as it was to play those venues, the writing was on the wall. It was only a matter of how the dominoes were going to fall, not whether they would fall. We could still play the biggest stadiums in South America, but we were in a very shaky position in North America. We knew we had to build KISS from the ground up all over again. Back in the States, I once again urged Gene to agree to do the most radical thing we could do, take off our makeup. Some people saw this as a bold move. I saw it as our only move. Our U.S. audience hadn't dwindled by chance. It had dwindled because what we were doing no longer rang true. People were tired of what KISS had become. With the new characters, we were one step removed from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, what the hell was Vinny's Ankh about? Rather than keeping the original personas and images alive, we had become a ridiculous menagerie. What was next? Turtle Boy? As we began to record Lick It Up, we thought about getting a manager to replace Bill. Up to this point, Howard Marks had taken over the business aspects of Bill's job, and we were basically managing ourselves. So we went to see a famous manager in L.A. and told him that we had decided to take the makeup off. Why don't you keep it on half your face, he said. On half of my face? That was when we realized how out of touch and out of sync most people were with Kiss. After all, Creatures was a good album. The problem was that people were listening with their eyes instead of their ears. If people didn't like what they saw, it was unlikely they were going to like what they heard. Agreeing to take the makeup off was, understandably, much harder for Gene. It was easier for me to do than for the guy with a ponytail on top of his head spitting blood all over the stage. But when creatures failed, common sense led us to the conclusion that we simply had no choice. Taking off the makeup gave us the best chance to continue. Even so, Gene didn't agree to jump until we were at the edge of the cliff. It was a leap of faith that was necessary for our own survival. We were going to have to find out whether we were a good enough band to exist without the makeup. If what people always said about us was true, that we were a gimmick, then I felt it was time to call it a day because we didn't deserve to continue. Was I nervous? Not really. I knew that what I did was from the heart, whether or not my face was white. It had become innate. I was going to continue to be exactly the same character. When people gave us kudos or told us we had guts for doing it, I was the first to say that we didn't do it for anything other than our own survival. There was no alternative. 
I don't mind taking credit for things done in the spirit of risk-taking, but this wasn't one of those moments. It wasn't a brave or noble move because it wasn't done from a place of strength. We were backed into a corner. I was also still reeling from finding out about Donna's marriage. I felt dazed and numb. I was seeing a psychiatrist at the time, and in the middle of a conversation one day, he said, The best thing to help you forget a woman is another woman. That was one of the most eye-opening things I ever heard during a therapy session. I was like, what? That's not deep. Really? I was looking for some Zen piece of advice, and this caught me totally off guard. Well, okay. I guess I can go with that. After that session, I thought to myself that maybe one way to feel better was to write a song about feeling better. The best way to move forward might be to sing a song about moving forward. I read somewhere that when Beethoven wrote his second symphony in 1802, a piece that as a kid I found extremely uplifting, he was suicidal. Maybe I could write myself out of a funk, too. Vinny and I wrote the song Lick It Up in my place on 80th Street in the music room with its now empty lighted guitar cases. Before we wrote, we tried to figure out what sort of thing we were going to try to do, and the therapist's words rang in my ear. We quickly came up with the title, Lick It Up, which sounded great. Life's a treat, and it ain't a crime to be good to yourself. It was a universal sentiment and something that I still certainly believed, whether or not I was living it every minute. It sure felt better than singing a song about being sad. Plus, the act of writing a great song, regardless of its sentiment, made me feel good. That was part of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. That was part of working my way out of the darkness. Creating was a way I was able to reestablish my footing. Other songs on Lick It Up, like A Million to One, cued more closely to how I was feeling. I think we all like to believe we're irreplaceable in a relationship and that nobody will ever give the person we love what we did, and A Million to One came out of that sentiment. Of course it was a bit unrealistic and self-serving in addition to not being true. Even though there was an excitement about taking off the makeup, it didn't mean our music had to change. We had been happy with the production on Creatures and felt confident working with Michael James Jackson again, continuing to build on our return to rock and roll. As the album neared completion, I felt excited when I saw the proofs of the cover. There we were. It was a declaration of sorts, and for all we were leaving behind, it was really saying something. I thought we were making a statement about the band and about the validity and credibility of it in our own eyes. Taking off the makeup said something about how much we valued the band. We could have just thrown in the towel and gone home. Instead, we were willing to shed our armor. I also realized that as soon as the record came out, I would no longer have that separation to cushion the impact, positive and negative, of success. The person who was famous would be the same one as the guy walking down the street, but that could be fun, too. It was going to be much more recognizable and visible, so in that sense it couldn't be bad, especially when it came to getting women. And anyway, I would had years of adapting to fame, and all those years in makeup had provided a transition. So it wasn't going to be like diving into a pool of ice water. Up to that point, MTV had always ignored us. We had filmed one of those I Want My MTV promos, and they never aired it. The video we had shot for Creatures, I Love It Loud, didn't get played. They chose not to give us any exposure, even though we desperately needed it in the wake of the Elder debacle to show that we had recommitted ourselves to doing what KISS did best. We were considered uncool at a network whose taste was led by a bunch of college interns. Suddenly, when we unmasked ourselves, all that changed. MTV finally embraced us at some level. We came up with a made-for-MTV unmasking. If you think about it, it was really just the unmasking of me and Gene. The other two guys were pretty much unknown commodities. That's not meant to disparage Eric or Vinny, but having played on an album that barely registered in the pop consciousness, they weren't much of a draw as far as unmasking went. To most people, Kiss was still the Catman, the Spaceman, the Star Child, and the Demon. But the cat was already out of the bag, so to speak, as was the spaceman. So in this case, to a certain extent, we sold a lot of sizzle without a very big stake. Still, Kiss Unmasking made a great soundbite and people bought into it. We managed to turn that into something of an event and get press out of it. And it worked. 
I was convinced that Lick It Up wasn't as good as Creatures of the Night, but the album sold way, way better. Probably four or five times as many albums sold in just the first few weeks after its release in September 1983. It wasn't the music the people hadn't liked, it was how the band had looked. Once we took off the makeup, we no longer wore the platform boots on stage, and we adopted a more generic style, tight, colorful clothes, sexual and flamboyant. We slid into what was pretty much the common look at the time. I mean, Robert Plant had cut his hair and was wearing parachute pants, for God's sake. Nobody was impervious to what was going on. Even the Who and the Stones were affected by what was considered the fashion of the time. We just kind of morphed into what became known as a hair band. We looked like dozens of other bands. There was no place anymore to be different. We had gotten rid of our calling card. We had taken off what made us different, so pretty much all we could look like was a run-of-the-mill rock and roll band. MTV had opened up the opportunity for a band from Idaho to look like a band from L.A., which could look like a band from London. There was a more homogenized look because every band suddenly realized they could go by hairspray and tease their hair up high and wear their mom's makeup and roll around on the floor with their guitars, just like they saw in somebody's video. It was the current state of bands, big hair, spandex, jewelry, femme makeup. A lot of bands with that look made a lot of awful music. It's mind-boggling how bad some of that stuff was. It had no soul, no roots. I know it was aping a lot of British blues-based bands, but as far as I was concerned, you couldn't play that type of music credibly unless you were at least aware of the likes of Hubert Sumlin, Howlin' Wolf, and Robert Johnson. Jimi Hendrix didn't start off playing Purple Haze. If you wanted to learn guitar, you had to go back. Most of the hair bands were horrible, with noodling guitar players tapping away without really being able to play. But we had to fit in with what was going on, so we did. And for better or worse, it got us through a couple of decades. Since MTV had covered our unmasking, we figured that this time around they would probably play a music video if we made one. We weren't going to get a world premiere slot or anything, but we were hopeful it would get played. The video for Lick It Up was a bigger production than I Love It Loud, but we managed to keep the costs fairly low. Some artists were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on videos at the time, and that seemed crazy to us, especially in light of MTV's track record of not playing us in the past. We wanted to make Lick It Up for a reasonable amount of money. The video opened with an image of skulls, and if you watch very closely, you'll see one of them wobble a little. They were made out of latex. We shot the video in a burned-out area of the Bronx. Aside from a few props like the skulls, that was all real. We didn't do anything but show up. It looked like Dresden in 1945, a post-apocalyptic wasteland. But it wasn't a stage set. I'd never seen anything like that before. I hadn't spent much time in the South Bronx. The crazy thing was that it wasn't just one small area. It was huge, like an entire bombed-out city or a massive movie set, broken down and decaying buildings as far as you could see, piles of bricks and rocks and garbage everywhere. It was the weirdest, most surreal thing I'd ever seen. When I saw the complete edited video, I thought it was cool. It was an MTV video. It had girls. It had fire. It had weird hairdos. It had all the things MTV videos had. Eric hated it because he had these little drumstick legs, so he's walking and you see these little feet with high-pointed shoes and these thick legs. And people seeing Vinny asked, Is that a girl? When we shot the cover for Lick It Up, Vinny wore a wig and it looked great. Afterwards, he gave us a hard time and insisted on not wearing it again. But then his hair kind of looked like the Gerber baby. He was very odd-looking anyway, and in that video, he looked extra odd as he tried to look sexy for the camera. Lick It Up went on to be certified double platinum. That blew Creatures of the Night away and reaffirmed for me that my suspicions had been correct. It wasn't that people didn't want Kiss. They wanted Kiss to drop something that no longer seemed genuine. Losing the makeup forced people to focus on the band, and they embraced the music. Lick It Up felt like a rebound in other ways, too, because shedding the makeup meant, in a sense, shedding an era, shedding a persona, and finally being out there, at least on the surface, as me. The person who was offstage was the same person in the videos. 
I felt that we had taken one very big step forward, and it meant that we could soldier on and continue to try to rebuild this thing I loved, KISS. The next test would be playing live without makeup. Were we just a bunch of knuckleheads in spandex and grease paint who blew shit up? Or were we a band, able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody else? We were about to find out. Chapter 42 The show in Portugal in October 1983 started with our normal introduction. The hottest band in the land! And then, suddenly, there we were on stage without any makeup on. And we were in rock clothes instead of platform boots and bat wings and the usual armored accessories, for the first time ever. I looked over at Gene. He looks just like he did during soundcheck, and there's an audience out there. The crowd didn't understand what was going on. The show had been promoted as a makeup show. Posters all over town showed the old characters. It took a few minutes for people to catch on. Did it have the same visual impact? No. I could feel the difference from the stage, but we had to leave all that behind to find out who we were. I wasn't sick of the makeup. I was sick of what it had become. We had to give it up to save what we loved most, the band. This was exciting and liberating, too. I relished the chance to prove ourselves all over again, not just to critics and the audience, but also to myself. On that tour, I realized that the most difficult part of taking off the makeup wasn't performing without the star. It was adjusting to getting my picture taken. Since we had originally determined not to be photographed without makeup in order to enhance our stage personas, I had a neurotic sixth sense that allowed me to feel cameras anywhere, even if it was in my peripheral vision or far off in the distance. When we took off the makeup, I still reflexively covered my face whenever I detected a camera. Vinny continued to baffle me. He still refused to sign his contract. He kept promising to sign it, but he never did. And there was no way to make him. We were stuck with no choice but to continue. We played in Oulu in northern Finland at the end of November 1983. It was the closest I'd ever been to the Soviet Union, maybe a hundred miles from the border. We traveled all day to get there, and when we arrived at the arena, it was bitter cold. I had to wear gloves and several layers of clothing in the backstage area. We were also starving after traveling all day and were very happy when a huge bowl of hearty beef soup was served. We sat around the family-style cauldron and ladled the soup into our bowls. It was so good, vegetables and beef in a flavorful broth, nice and warming. Vinny ate part of his bowl and then, saying he was finished, dumped the leftovers back into the cauldron in the middle of the table. We all looked at him in disbelief. Where did you grow up? What are you doing? You just ruined our food. Things with Vinny were getting worse and worse. He kept pushing his solos to more and more ridiculously epic lengths, stalling the show. The final straw came at a concert back in the States, in Long Beach, California, in January 1984. That night he went on for so long that Gene and I just walked back on stage as he was still playing. I went to the mic and said, Vinny Vincent, lead guitar! Solo over. When the lights went down after the next song, Vinny came over to me in the dark and said, you bastard, you humiliated me. I swear if he raises his arm, I'm going to knock him out right here. It was a tense moment. I thought for sure the lights were going to come up and that prick would be lying on his back on the stage. He was done. When we were ready to record our next album, Animalize, we started searching for another guitar player. Although to say we is a bit of an exaggeration. Gene had basically disappeared by that point, too. While Creatures had been a band effort and Gene had participated in Lick It Up, I felt abandoned when it came time to make Animalize. After informing me without any warning or discussion that he wouldn't be around for the album, Gene went into a studio and crapped out some demos as fast as he could. Then he was off to do a movie. He left me with a pile of mostly unusable junk. Great. A guitar maker named Grover Jackson had put me in touch with a goofy, oversized guy named Mark Norton. Mark wasn't the sharpest pencil in the pack, but he played in the style that had then become popular. Eddie Van Halen had completely changed the game by this point, and everybody wanted to be fast and flashy, 
tapping, playing with two hands and their nose if you let them. Mark, who called himself Mark St. John, everybody was Saint something or other in the 80s, proved somewhat difficult to work with too, though for different reasons than Vinny. One afternoon I told him, come in tomorrow with a solo for this song. He came in and played it the next day. It was pretty good. Cool, I said. Now play it again. He played a completely different thing. What? He said. I can't play the same thing twice. That's how this is done, I said. Another time I said to him, you know, sometimes it's not about what you play, it's about what you don't play. Listen to Jimmy Page. Listen to Paul Kossoff. Listen to Eric Clapton. I can play faster than those guys, scoffed Mark. Houston, we have a problem. In the end, I managed to get Animalize done basically on my own. I fixed Gene's songs, fixed the band situation, pulled solos out of Mark, and saw through the making of the album. I also named the album, designed the album art, and arranged the cover photo shoot. On top of it all, I spent big chunks of time in our office personally promoting the album, glad-handing radio people, cajoling MTV into playing the videos, and doing all the things a manager would normally do. But despite his minimal involvement, Gene still wanted his name on the album as a co-producer. And naturally, he still expected a share of the money equal to mine. I didn't think it was fair. I wasn't getting half of whatever he was getting paid for his extracurricular indulgences. Gene still felt an entitlement to nearly half the songs on the album and subsequent albums, but there was no quality control. Most of those songs are forgotten today, and not by coincidence. He simply wasn't putting enough time and effort into the band. I didn't care who wrote the hits, but if he wasn't even trying, there was no way we should pretend it was a partnership. I started to get pissed off about all the time he spent on other things, whether it was movies, working with other bands, or cutting ribbons at shopping centers. I felt very strongly that we needed to commit to the band for it to survive. It was a crucial time. Whether or not he liked it, he was still Gene Simmons from KISS, and I didn't want him to destroy what he was standing on as he reached for other fruit. He was taking the band for granted, or worse, he was abusing what we had built together, and for what? A lot of things he was doing would prove a waste of time. I didn't understand his need to bask in whatever questionable spotlight he could find. I saw one of his movies and thought it was embarrassing. At the same time, Gene spent 24-7 putting himself in the spotlight and also chose to distort the public image of the band by increasing his perceived importance within KISS even as he was withdrawing from active involvement in it. Resentment started to simmer in me. After we shot the cover photos showcasing Mark, he came down with a rare arthritic condition. It often affects people's knees, but in Mark's case, it struck his hand. If you're going to have one part of your body swell, it shouldn't be your hand. Mark couldn't move his fingers. My doctor says it will go away in two weeks, he told us. I called him every day. Any better? No. Finally, we had to go out and tour. Animalize came out in September 1984 and kept the momentum going, selling even better than Lick It Up. I called Bruce Kulick, whom I'd met through his brother, Bob, and who had played a solo on one of the tracks of Animal Eyes. I asked him whether he could tour with us for a few weeks as a stand-in for Mark. He agreed. We traveled for quite a while with Bruce playing on stage each night and Mark hanging out backstage. We kept thinking he would wake up the next day and be able to play again. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Mark never played a single show on that tour, and finally we let him go, and Bruce became the permanent guitar player. Bruce was a real mensch and very funny. If you asked him how he was, he would give you a 10-minute dissertation about how his fuzz box wasn't working quite right, or describe his upset stomach in details better left unspoken, or complain about how he had gas the day before. But he was a terrific guitar player and a great team player. Bruce became our fourth guitar player, and at some point I couldn't help thinking, what the fuck? I didn't want Kiss to become a backup band for me and Gene, or just for me for that matter. We weren't Ozzy or Bowie shuffling through musicians, or at least I didn't want to be. This was supposed to be a band. I tended to frown on groups that went through numerous lineups. But even so, the chemistry we looked for had nothing to do with what happened offstage or outside the studio. That ship had sailed. We looked for functionality. 
We hadn't socialized as a band for a very long time, and while we didn't dislike being around each other, each member of the band was there just to play a role. We weren't riding around in a station wagon telling jokes anymore. We spent October and November of 1984 touring Europe again, this time with Bon Jovi as our support act throughout. We had an impressive track record of picking winners, Bob Seger, John Mellencamp, Tom Petty, ACDC, Judas Priest, Rush, and Iron Maiden were all among the acts we'd chosen to open tours. Bon Jovi had a minor radio hit at that point called Runaway. John Bon Jovi was a smart guy and always sat with us at the hotel bar and asked questions about how various production expenses broke down. He was intent on getting as much information as possible, and he asked business questions. Now that we were basically managing ourselves, we had the answers. Near the end of the tour, Bon Jovi's manager, Doc McGee, approached me. Would you be willing to write with John for their next album? If you want to write with someone great, I said, call Desmond Child. I gave Doc Desmond's number. Maybe a year later, Desmond came over to my apartment and played Slippery When Wet for me, the album he ended up writing with John and Richie. I was impressed and called John afterwards. I think this could be a big album for you, I said. An understatement, to say the least. Chapter 43 We now had back-to-back -back platinum albums. People were starting to trust us again. We filled and even sold out venues again, bringing in 10,000 people, which, if not quite up to the old days, certainly put us in very credible company. The needle was moving in the right direction. Most importantly, I was making money doing what I loved, playing guitar, jumping around on stage and screaming and preening a lot. And yet, despite selling two million copies each of Lick It Up and Animalize, we certainly weren't top dogs anymore. Some bands, Van Halen, Def Leppard, and soon Bon Jovi, were selling 10 million copies of their albums. Despite the fact that we were making money, our record label could not have cared less about KISS. I think the label was dominated by kids barely out of college who were busy going after bands like Dan Reed Network. And no wonder, 30 years later, they're still a household name, right? When we played concerts in New York, nobody from our own record company would bother to come. They would all be in some downtown club watching a band fresh out of a fraternity house basement. Nothing against Dan Reed or his network, but it was annoying and even hurtful to be taken for granted like that. The non-makeup albums became successful because the fan base gave us a second chance. The record company did fuck all for us. As we set to work on a follow-up album, Asylum, the problem for me was that my ostensible partner had the same attitude as the record company. Gene just didn't care. He would show up in the studio after being up all night with some third-rate band he was producing, exhausted, with some half-assed song he wanted to put on our album that he may or may not have actually written. Again, he felt he should get a quota of songs on the record, and again, he wasn't delivering the goods. He didn't devote the time to it. If I suggested he was spreading himself too thin, he said, No, no, I'm giving a hundred percent. My feeling that there was a traitor in the midst grew daily every time Gene denied his subpar and often non-existent contributions to the band. Somebody wasn't playing for the team. Somebody was thinking only about himself. Kiss was a distant second on his agenda. You are the one person I thought I could always count on. When I voiced my sense of betrayal, Gene said, well, you can go do things too. That was evasive bullshit. If I did, there wouldn't have been a band or any albums. I wasn't about to see the band disintegrate, and he knew it. Not only that, the license he offered me to go do things was predicated on his own decision to do things. I wasn't looking for an excuse to do other things. He was. It wasn't like he conferred with me about what or when he was going to do things. He was just looking out for number one, with little regard for me. He also developed a new habit of using the KISS logo and his KISS makeup for personal projects without my approval, knowing full well it was needed. When I raised objections, he would offer a weak, insincere, sorry, only to be repeated again next time as though we'd never spoken about it. He was clearly going to do whatever he wanted to, regardless of any objections from me or even his legal obligations under our partnership. For Gene, sorry was a meaningless hall pass to placate me 
until he would, of course, do the same thing again when he thought it would benefit him. In actuality, it never meant, sorry for what I did, it was purely, sorry that it bothers you. In addition to being offensive and insulting, his total disregard hurt my feelings. Apparently, I just had to play by his rules. I had the choice of walking away or doing the work of two people. The catch was that I had to share the credit, even if I did double the work. The animosity continued to build. I also started to see more and more interviews where Gene took credit for things he was only partially responsible for, or in some cases had nothing to do with it all. And he never refuted or corrected misinformed or inaccurate assumptions from interviewers about his outsized role. When I would call Gene on it and show him quotes from countless interviews, he would emphatically tell me, I didn't say that. Now, I wasn't new to doing Q&A features or taking part in a taped interview that was going to be transcribed and published later. The number of times I read something attributed to me that was untrue could have been counted on one hand with fingers to spare. If James Brown was the hardest working man in show business, then Gene Simmons was, at least according to his account, the most misquoted man in show business. I didn't buy it. Being lied to and having my role and the role of others diminished and even negated was not only selfish, it was unkind. It hurt. One thing Gene and I had always agreed on was that we were each other's brother. What we obviously did not agree on was how you treat your brother. One of the results of Gene's diminished involvement was that, at least in the context of the band, I shared the spotlight less. It became my spotlight. It wasn't by chance that my songs became the popular songs. Nobody else was putting in the time to write decent songs. If Gene wanted to be more than the bass player, he had to do something more. Anybody can write a song in five minutes. The difference is that since we had a record deal, Gene got to put his songs on an album, whether or not they were any good. When I wrote songs like Heaven's on Fire or Tears Are Falling, it was because I had to. I was the one doing the work, and I enjoyed getting the credit I deserved. During the height of MTV's popularity, I became a sort of 80s pretty boy, though it was certainly a different time, and with feathered earrings, rouge, and pink gloves, courtesy of Van Halen's stylist whom we hired, I looked as much like a drag queen as anything else. Let's just say the criteria for what was considered attractive was a little different during the hairband era. I had a few girlfriends during those years, but for the most part, relationships were still just about companionship and sex. I didn't want exclusivity and didn't expect it from women. I just wanted to have a good time. I had things sorted out so that even when we were off the road, I was never alone. I split my time between New York and L.A., renting apartments out there or living at hotels like the Sunset Marquee. L.A. was the place I went to indulge in what always started as carefree excess with women. When those relationships inevitably got too complicated, I would go back to New York. Despite the newfound attention through KISS music videos, I wasn't comfortable being a public figure all the time. With his movie career in mind, Gene sought to surround himself with the most famous people possible. I came in a distant second in that department. It was fun to read about who I was involved with in the gossip magazines, but it wasn't so much fun to read about a breakup. Once I peered over the shoulder of a woman who was reading an article in The Star in which the actress Lisa Hartman explained why she would never marry singer Paul Stanley. I could have done without that stuff. The kind of people who lived in the tabloids considered themselves only as important as the amount of press they got. That was how they defined themselves. When I was around people like that, in addition to dealing with my own shit, I had to deal with somebody else's shit. Like how hurt they were that their segment on Access Hollywood wasn't longer. One woman I dated in L.A. worried that her house was too far east, on the eastern edge of Beverly Hills rather than smack dab in the middle. Another one apologized that she lived in the valley rather than on the Hollywood side of the hills. I spent time in those superficial circles, but I knew that I didn't want to live in them. None of the relationships was leading anywhere, but they did stave off the loneliness. One night, late in the year, we played a show in New Jersey before heading home to New York. A penthouse pet I knew came backstage after the show and said, I have a Christmas present for you. I said, I'll give you a ride back to the city in my limo. Once on the highway, she undid my jeans and gave me my present. Then she lifted her head and said, Merry Christmas. Hey, what about Hanukkah? 
As far as my sexual exploits, during the 70s, I had paddled around the pool, so to speak. During the 80s, I was doing backflips in it. I went to a party one night at the Playboy Mansion, and as soon as I walked in the door, I found myself standing in front of a Playmate of the Year whom I had seen in the magazine and thought was incredibly hot. We spoke for a few minutes, and then she said, Do you want to leave? Sure, I said, half wondering what would happen if she were to reply, Then why don't you get the fuck out of here? Instead, she said, Let's go. We continued the festivities at her place. My class at the High School of Music and Art set up a 15th reunion that year, too, the class of 1970. I had missed my 10th reunion because of the tour in Australia just after Eric Carr joined the band, so I wasn't going to miss the 15th. More than seeing how everyone's lives had turned out, I knew I wanted to rub my success in their faces. The woman I was seeing in New York at the time was, surprise, a Playboy centerfold. I thought about taking her to the reunion, but then I thought about that date I'd had back then with the coolest girl in school, Victoria. The date where I ended up talking to Victoria's dad as she went off to bed. The date that resulted in the hottest chick in class snickering at me for the rest of high school. I decided I would go to the reunion by myself. I told my bunny I'd give her a call once I got the lay of the land at the reunion. What I didn't tell her was that I sort of hoped I could finally bang my failed conquest. I had a suntan earned at the Sunset Marquee, and I wore a sharp, tailored blue silk suit. I couldn't wait to see all these people who had considered me the least likely to accomplish anything. The event was held at the school, and when I walked in, all I could think was that everybody was too big for the furniture. The atmosphere was surprisingly somber, and most of the people had not aged well. I still pictured them all as young people, full of vitality and dreams and aspirations, and here they were, looking like they were at a Halloween party, dressed as old people. They looked old and broken. Fifteen years later, Victoria had short, mousy hair and was wearing clunky, orthopedic-style shoes and a frumpy skirt. She wasn't so hot anymore. At first I felt a brief jolt of vindication at seeing her like that, thinking of the way she had never let me live down the folly of our one date. But then I wish she could have looked as good as she had 15 years before. This was just depressing. Another guy there had been a real Adonis in high school, handsome, with long curly hair and a great voice. He could howl like Robert Plant and carried himself that way. Now he was pasty and bald as a billiard ball. The best-looking guy in school didn't necessarily remain the best-looking, and me, the guy nobody thought would ever win a race, turned out to be a marathoner. The whole thing was uncomfortable and disappointing. I left quickly and picked up my waiting girlfriend and went out for a nice dinner. I had found no joy in rubbing my success in people's faces, and I never wanted to go to another reunion. Chapter 44 Asylum sold nearly as well as Animal Eyes, but the band started to peter out again after the album was released, and by early 1986, we were off the road again for about a year. Howard Marks, our business manager, called me one afternoon and said he'd gotten a call from Tom Zutat, an A&R man famous for signing Motley Crue. Tom just signed this band, Howard said, and wanted to know if you want to go check them out. They're looking for a producer. Well, Gene was off making another movie. We weren't going to work on the next record until the following year. Why not? Howard came with me to meet the band, a bunch of young guys called Guns N' Roses. We had arranged to meet them at an apartment their manager had rented for them near the corner of La Cienica and Fountain. I introduced bald, pot-bellied Howard as my bodyguard as a joke, but after looking around for a few minutes, I could see why they didn't get it. Izzy was unconscious, with drool coming out of the side of his mouth. It wasn't clear whether he was sleeping or dead. That's how rough he looked. Duff and Stephen were very nice, and Stephen was just glowing about what a big Kiss fan he was. I didn't realize that the half-comatose, curly-headed lead guitar player who called himself Slash was what had become of the sweet kid I'd spoken to during the interviews before the recording of Creatures a few years earlier. Then Axel chatted with me and played a few songs on a crappy cassette player they had lying around. When he played Night Train, I thought it was really good, but I told him that maybe the chorus could be used as a pre-chorus instead, and there could be another chorus added afterwards. That was the last time he ever spoke to me. Ever. 
Slash roused himself, and he and I started talking about the Stones. I showed him Keith's five-string open G tuning, which was the setup Keith used to write all his stuff. I took a string off and retuned a guitar, and he thought it was very cool. I also offered to help Slash get in touch with people who could hook him up with some free guitars. We were sponsored by all sorts of instrument companies, and I figured a young guy like him could use some help getting equipment to record with. That night I went to see their gig at Raji's, a little dive in Hollywood. I thought the songs they had played for me were good, but they didn't prepare me for seeing the band live. Guns N' Roses were stupendous. I was shocked, given the collection of wastoids I'd seen earlier that afternoon, and I immediately realized I was witnessing true greatness. I went to see them perform again at another club called Gazari's. It later became the Key Club. They weren't happy with the guy mixing their sound, and Slash asked me out of the blue to help out. Decades later, Slash's recollection of the night would be faulty at best. He liked to pretend I had dared to meddle with their sound. God forbid this guy from Kiss would have anything to do with guns. I mean, what could be worse than a guy from Kiss, of all things? He also recalled that I had a blonde trophy wife with me. But I wasn't married and was in fact there with a short brunette named Holly Knight, who was a songwriter famous for Love is a Battlefield, among other hits. There is obviously a reason why defense attorneys never want to put alcoholics or drug addicts on the witness stand. That was years later, of course. Immediately after my interactions with the band, I started to hear lots of stories Slash was saying behind my back. He called me gay, made fun of my clothes, all sorts of things designed to give himself some sort of rock credibility at my expense. This was years before his top hat, sunglasses, and dangling cigarette became a cartoon costume that he would continue to milk with the best of us for decades. I didn't wind up being involved with GNR's album. No surprise there. The surprise came a few months later when Slash called me and wanted to follow up on my offer to help him get some free guitars. You want me to help you get guitars after you went around saying all that shit about me behind my back? Slash got real quiet. You know, one thing you're going to have to learn is not to air your dirty laundry in public. Nice knowing you. Go fuck yourself. Chapter 45 Five-string open G tuning wasn't the only thing I learned from Keith Richards. When I ran into him in person... He told me he'd been offered the chance to buy anything he wanted from our storage space in New York, part of a warehouse where we kept old stage sets and equipment, all the makeup era outfits, lots of instruments, all sorts of things. Yeah, mate, he laughed. Could have bought the lot of it. At first, I simply didn't understand. Was this the legendary English sense of humor? Was it some misremembered anecdote he'd somehow mangled? But the more I thought about it, the more worried I got. Now that he mentioned it, I had noticed things disappearing. Several times I'd gone to the warehouse to grab guitars I wanted to use, only to come up empty. Once it was a guitar that I had stashed there only a week before. I knew it had to be there. The solution to the mystery was depressing. Bill O'Coin, who somehow still had keys to the warehouse, was secretly selling our stuff out the back door. By then he had spiraled so far down that he was couch surfing from one friend's place to another. His last client, Billy Idol, had left him. When Billy Idol abandoned you for your drug use in the 1980s, let's just say it must have been bad. So we relocated. We had a few things torched or cut down for scrap, like the stage set from the Animalize tour. But we moved most of it first to New Jersey and later to L.A. Bill's activities soon turned out to be the least of our worries, however. I still lived in a one-bedroom apartment and had only one car, but Howard Mark started saying I needed to tighten my belt. He told me I had to cut back on the money I was giving my parents. That raised the hairs on the back of my neck. It wasn't that I expected tour money when we weren't on tour, but what about all the money that had been invested on our behalf? Where was that? I'm not living ostentatiously. I'm not living some ridiculous lifestyle. Something tells me he's making too much money. Eventually, I said it straight out. If anybody's going to get less money, it should be you. That didn't go over so well. The music industry has never been kind to artists. In the case of our business managers, I didn't want to believe they had acted in bad faith. But certainly, some decisions had been made that smelled pretty bad once I started sniffing around. 
The big wake-up call came from an odd source, my therapist, Dr. Jesse Hilson. I started talking about my misgivings and all the things being said about my finances, and he started asking questions about my earnings, about retirement accounts, none of which, embarrassingly, I could answer. I wasn't supposed to show our financial statements to anyone, which again should have been a red flag, but Dr. Hilson agreed to have a look at some of them. And what he asked after examining some statements was a shock. Do you know that you owe the IRS millions of dollars? What? Yeah, and it's overdue, and they've given notice that they're going to come after you. How is this possible? Howard had been like a family member. I had always trusted him. Our long relationship represented an increasingly rare instance of stability with the band. Now I had uncovered many examples of a highly questionable judgment. I didn't want to nitpick over legality. The point was that a lot of decisions had been made that clearly weren't in my or the band's best interests. Decisions that wouldn't have been made the same way if our business managers had been making them about their own money. There were investments with people who just happened to be associated with them and our attorneys. There were tax shelters that had gone awry and never been addressed. There were reckless decisions. A lot of it smacked of the same sort of cronyism I'd seen elsewhere inside the music business, and I had always thought we were immune to it because of Howard. Now I wanted to spit at him. It was a huge betrayal. I called Gene. Listen, I said, we're in financial trouble. Nonsense, said Gene. Things are not as they appear, I'm telling you. I met up with him and tried to explain. He scoffed and acted dismissive and irritated. So I had to meet Dr. Hilson, who showed Gene what was what in the statements. Gene was very defensive, even antagonistic. But the problems were all there in black and white. Within a day or so, I told Gene that I was leaving Howard. He wanted to stay. You can stay if you want, I said, but I'm out of here. You do whatever you want. He was stunned that I was jumping ship with or without him. It wasn't going to matter. As it sunk in that I was dead serious, he began to waver. Eventually, he said, I'll go with you. I wouldn't take Howard's calls and never spoke to him again. It was not a happy day parting company like that with yet another member of the team who had let us down. Howard was the last vestige of the original team to fall by the wayside, but there was no way to explain all that was there in black and white, filling countless files and documents. We got outside legal advisors and started trying to untangle the mess which they agreed wasn't as it should be. From that day forward, we never let anyone else sign a single check in our names. I've used a lot of ink signing my own name since then, whether it's for my monthly phone bill or the construction of a massive stage set. No matter how small or large, Gene and I kept everything close to the vest from then on. Maybe we had finally learned our lesson by taking our lumps. But it certainly wasn't a case of being brilliant. It was a case of being resilient and seizing an opportunity to rectify the situation once we recognized something was wrong. Interestingly, even though it was me who got us out of a situation that was a ticking time bomb and would have decimated us, Gene continued to be lauded as a savvy businessman. I guess people just look for simplistic distinctions, as in Gene's the business guy and Paul's the creative guy. But it wasn't Gene who realized the ship was sinking and it wasn't Gene who changed course. As far as I was concerned, Gene's most successful venture in business was promoting the perception that he was a savvy businessman. That had been an undeniable success. But then again, given that he seemed to spend 24-7 promoting that perception, perhaps it was no surprise. I didn't fault him. That was something he saw as a life accomplishment. For me to compete in that arena would have taken away from other pursuits and challenges in my life. Gene was about nonstop self-promotion. I was about ongoing self-discovery. I wanted to figure out how to be happy, and that was far more important to me than building a myth that wouldn't change the reality of who I really was. After all, just because you can get other people to believe something doesn't mean that you believe it. Didn't I know it? Transitory external factors seemed to make Gene happy, and he wasn't interested in looking inside. That may even be soft-peddling it. Gene resolutely resisted looking inside. For him, perception was reality. The surface was the all. That distinction summed up the stark difference between us. And maybe that is also why any sense of unity created by our decision to break away from Howard was short-lived. 
That episode brought us together to fight what we both perceived as injustice. But as soon as we started to work on our next album, Crazy Nights, I found myself right back at square one. Gene would stagger into the studio after not sleeping all night. He was too busy once again making movies or working with other bands, including one called Black and Blue, who had opened for us on the last tour. Gene ended up writing some songs with the band's guitar player, Tommy Thayer, or he spent the whole time on the phone working this or that angle. The few songs Gene brought in seemed to have been written by other people, with Gene pasting his name on after the fact. Needless to say, once again, the songs were not impressive. His lack of involvement had become a running joke in the studio, but it wasn't funny anymore. If anything, the confrontation with Howard only increased the sense I had that Gene was screwing me. In his own way, he had betrayed me as much as Ace and Peter had. At this point, he was riding my coattails. If Gene wanted an equal share, he should have to do some of the work of keeping the band going. I was seriously pissed off. I can't live like this anymore. Outside the studio one afternoon, I asked Gene to get in my car. I took a deep breath. Whatever the consequences of what I was about to say, I knew it had to be done. I couldn't go on like this, feeling like I was in a pressure cooker, dealing with everything to do with Kiss on my own, and still obligated to treat someone who was AWOL as an equal partner. This isn't okay anymore, I told him. It wasn't as uncomfortable as I'd expected, in part because it felt good to finally let off the steam. I'm done with this. You can't expect to be my partner if you're not going to hold up your end. That was the beginning of a heart-to-heart -heart conversation that began there in the car and then continued over the phone for several more days. As I vented, I never raised my voice. I've always believed that the person who yells loses. Quitting the band was never an option for me. I also did not relish the idea of taking over the band on my own. But if Gene's reduced involvement was going to continue, I wanted to be paid and recognized for my ever-increasing responsibilities. I wasn't sure what to expect, but apparently the talk resonated with Gene, because a few days later, he approached me and handed me a Jaguar brochure. He said he wanted me to pick one out for myself. He wanted to buy me a Jag to show his appreciation for all I'd done to keep the band going. It was a nice move on his part, but I had my eye on a Porsche. When we shot the video for the second single from Crazy Nights, Reason to Live, the storyline involved a beautiful woman blowing up a car. It was a black Porsche 928. And I drove it home from the video shoot, compliments of Gene.